make them right here. This is not right here, not right here, not like this. Just right here. Yes. Comfortable spot. Yes. So. Okay. Thank you. Questions? No. Nope. Pretty basic. Yep. If they have troubles with it, no problem. Because <laughs> yeah. it needs to be in this area. Okay. So See. Not like down here. Just right here. Okay. So. Okay. You got it? Yep. Yes. I'll have Red live on this side, hopefully. Are we holding? Okay. Media working in the uh, workroom, we are about five minutes away from our first press conference of the day with the University of Miami head coach Jim Laranega. So if you are going to be covering Miami, we will be starting in roughly five minutes. Yes, sir. I do.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NCAA Midwest Regional, hosted by the Big 12 Conference. Our first news conference of the day will be the University of Miami, and the leadoff will be uh, Coach Jim Laranega. Coach will be in here for a 15-minute time frame, followed by three student-athletes from Miami. And so you can plan ahead. Uh, the student-athletes are Jordan Miller, Anthony Walker, and Isaiah Wong, okay? Uh, a couple of things to announce for you, for those of you that are interested in uh, the satellite feed. Um, it'll be the same one throughout the week, Galaxy 7, K16 slot A, and the downlink is 12006.5V, as in Victor. Again, I'll repeat that, Galaxy 17, K16 slot A, downlink is 12006.5V, as in Victor. As a courtesy to your fellow media members, You've heard this story before, as well as the coaches and our student athletes. Please remember to silence your cell phones while you're in the interview room. Uh, please provide your name and affiliation. Tell us who you are, where you're from. Each time you ask a question, um, if you're joining us from Zoom, please raise the hand function feature for a question so we will be able to know that you have a question from Zoom. And then just a reminder to people here in the interview room, recording the press conferences on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. Another thing to remember while the interviews are going on on stage here in the interview room, the team locker rooms will be open during that 30 minute time frame. And our last thing, please during the interview times, Please do not use this uh, curtained area as a cut through to go to the locker rooms because it's a little busy back there with coaches and student athletes. So if you could maybe walk around, know it's a little bit further, but uh, during the interview hour, if we could ask you to do that. We will start with Coach uh, Laranega in just a bit. I'm ready when Coach is. <clears throat> Coach, you got your own drink. In case you need more, we have some there for you. And we wait about another 20 seconds and we'll start. I'm sorry? We'll wait another 20 seconds and we'll start. Oh, that's right. Just take your time and get started. You know what you want to do. Okay. Okay, we are ready to begin our news conference for the Midwest Regional. Uh, our first, our leadoff hitter is Coach uh, Jim Laranega from the University of Miami. Coach, welcome back to the Sweet 16, second year in a row. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Okay, maybe an opening statement, and then we will start questions uh, from our media. Anything in particular you want to say about getting here to Kansas City? Well, first of all, I think March Madness is the greatest sporting event in the world, and, and uh, we're so proud to represent not only the University of Miami, but the Atlantic Coast Conference. We believe it's a fantastic league with 15 great universities, and I'm very proud of our players for the way they played last weekend in accomplishing the, the goal of, of reaching the Sweet 16. Thank you, Coach. Okay, we have microphones on both sides of the room. Addie's on our left and Rachel's on our right. So first question for Coach would be on the front row. Hey, uh, Todd Paul, we KSHB here in Kansas City. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Nigel Pack, the impact he's made. How, he seems to have, you know, like assimilated into to your culture and your, your team pretty quickly. So just how critical has his play and, and him, him in the locker room been in getting to this point? Uh, well, the first thing is uh, – we had a great point guard last year on our run to the Elite Eight, a young man named Charlie Moore. So we were looking for someone similar to Charlie who could pass it, shoot it. Nigel was an interesting prospect for us because he had played the two-guard spot but really was interested in moving to the point. So we were very interested in that because we wanted a point guard who could really shoot. So um, he has made such a smooth um, transition uh, from Kansas State to Miami 
primarily because of his personality. Uh, he and Isaiah Wong hit it off like day one, and they developed a great bond on and off the court, a great relationship of handling the ball and sharing the ball and, and playing to win. They both just care about winning, and so they're very team-oriented. Uh, and Nigel's teammates love him. I mean, he's a very articulate young man. Uh, his mom and dad have raised him very, very well, and uh, we're just happy to have him. He's uh, a fantastic shooter, but he's also working very hard defensively, and uh, he's sharing the ball with his teammates as the quarterback of our team. A reminder to media listening in on Zoom, please raise your hand, and we will come to you later in the news conference. Other questions for Coach? Okay, Coach, on Coach's right. Yeah, Daniel Gotera, KHOU uh, in Houston. When you put on U of H game tape, what's that, what's that first thing that pops out to you? Uh, I'd, I'd say their defense and their rebounding. Is that two things? Okay. It, it's a combination of those two things. Uh, first of all, at the defensive end of the floor, they're as physical as any team that I've seen all year long. They put so much pressure on you at every position. Some, some teams are good putting pressure on the guards, but these guys put pressure at every position. And then they, they, they rebound the ball tremendously well at both ends, especially at the offensive end, where they're able to, if they miss a shot, uh, just offense rebound and score either at the rim or kick it out for a three. And they got great guard play. They got really terrific athletic big guys. So, you know, they've earned their, their ranking of number one in the country. We'll move back here on the front. Uh, Todd Palmer, KSHB again. A little bit different situation to what Kelvin's going to face next year, but obviously you went from a mid-major to the ACC. He's going from a mid-major conference to the Big 12 next year. And I just wondered, what is the difference? Um, is it just the, the constant barrage and the consistency of the teams? Or what, what, what can you tell me about what that transition is like going from a, a mid-major to uh, a Power 5 conference like that? Well... Uh, I'll tell you a story. When I got the Miami job, someone said, oh, you're going to be able to recruit so many better players, it's going to be so much easier for you than it was at the mid-majors. I said, yeah, sure, it'll be real easy beating Duke and Carolina for a recruit. The fact of the matter is it's, it's all about competition. So you go to the Big 12, you've got to compete with those people. And each of them has a tradition of how they play. The coaches have their own style. And Kelvin is an experienced guy. You know, he coached in the Pac-12, he coached in the Big Ten, he's coached in the NBA. So he's, he's been around the block. He will have no problem making the adjustment. It's all in the recruiting. And now that comes down to really two things, the portal and NIL. So I, I have no idea what kind of commitment uh, uh, all those schools are making in the Big 12, but to be competitive, you got to be competitive in that category. Hey, Coach, toward the back on the right. Uh, Sam Lance with Adam Zaguri and Sags blog. On the subject of – Is Adam uh, here? He is not. He's, uh, he's back on the East Coast still. <laughs> uh, but obviously in today's game, the, the transfer portal is very important. So I wanted to ask uh, if you thought that getting deeper into the NCAA tournament – uh, could be a disadvantage for the portal because there's a lot of teams right now who <laughs> are out and they're able to recruit guys and they have guys leaving, stuff like that. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, how about that? The more you win, the less you're able to recruit. I, I, it, you know, That doesn't really make sense, but it is true. It's a fact that uh, you know while we're playing, our, our focus is on playing Houston tomorrow night. Um, I think all the teams that have made the Sweet 16, their goal is to move on. Uh, recruiting uh, <coughs> is a, a, a separate challenge. So when, whenever you can, like right now, I, I, don't, I don't even know how many guys we'll have back because we may have guys who want to transfer. We, don't, we were one of only nine teams last year that did not have a single transfer. Nine teams out of 363. Oh, that's 356 teams that had a transfer. So... You know, we'll do uh, our due diligence with finding out who might be interested in us and see how many scholarships we have to fill. 
but every, I think every school has that challenge because uh, the portal for everyone is like recruiting a McDonald's All-American in a, a fast-forward situation because the, the portal, you know, starts basically now in this past week or so, and it's only going to last until May. When you recruit high school kids, it starts when they're sophomores, juniors in high school, and you recruit them for a year or two. So uh, this is like speed dating. It's like going, going on, on uh, Match.com. Okay. Next. I have never been on Match.com. I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying, Coach. In the back, on the left. Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. I wonder what four Sweet 16s in the last ten tournaments? I mean, what does that say about what, where your program It says we're in very good company because only 16 teams have been able to do that in the last ten years. And all of them are the names that, if you had to guess, those are the ones you would guess. I think if you didn't know that we were one of the 16 teams to make uh, a run to the Sweet 16 four out of the last 10 years, you would not have guessed us until maybe you got to, you know, guess 100. Uh, everybody has, has looked at the University of Miami as a football program, as a football school. And that's, there's a good reason for that. Our football program has won five national championships. And even those who follow baseball know we've, we've won – four national championships in baseball. But our basketball program has really been elevated over the last 12 years. My staff has done a fantastic job of recruiting quality young men who play quality basketball, and they're all graduating. So we're very, very pleased with the company we're keeping. Okay, here on the right. Uh, Sam Lamps again. Uh, I saw Luga Poplar was back in practice today. Do you have any update on his status? Well, we didn't practice Monday. He didn't practice Tuesday or Wednesday. Today's the first first chance he had to, to go up and down since our game against uh, Indiana. So he looked good to me. Um, I'll talk to my trainer, and he'll he'll be, give me an indication of whether Luga's ready to go tomorrow. If he's ready to go, he'll be in the start lineup as always. Let's take a break from here in Kansas City and go to Zoom. Alfred, do we have any questions? Yes, we have one. You ready for it? Mm -hmm. Christopher Heidel, please unmute yourself, identify your affiliation, and ask your question. Mr. Heidel? Hi, you guys can hear me? Can yes, hear we, Chris can, Idell we can from hear Herbert you. Radio. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Hi, Coach Larry Nagin. This is Chris Idell from Herbert Radio in Baltimore. How you doing? Yeah, good. Um, you have a kid from Perry Hall, Maryland, and Anthony Walker. You know, you do a really good job recruiting around the, you know, the Baltimore metro area, D.C. and all that. Why, is such, why are there good players in, in this area? Oh, that's easy. Uh, the DMV, as we all know it, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Northern Virginia, is the most fertile land for recruiting that there is in the entire country. From uh, Northern Virginia, there are tremendous prospects, uh, a volume of prospects that every school in the country comes to that, that area to recruit. And when I was at George Mason, we made a run to the Final Four in 2006, and eight of our players came from the DMV. So at Miami, we always made it a priority to stay in touch with our...
for the uh, benefit of our stenographers listening in because it wasn't on our text chain, the student athletes from Miami will be Jordan Miller, Anthony Walker, and Isaiah Wong. Okay? Jordan Miller, Anthony Walker, Isaiah Wong, and they should be here in just a little bit. That will also be a 15 minute time frame ending at 1225. Don't forget, the uh, locker rooms are open while the team is on the stage for 30 minutes. Locker rooms are open for additional interviews with other student athletes. And uh, media in the back, we've been told that Miami, the student athletes have left the locker room and are heading toward our area. So if you're covering Miami, we're about ready to start. Okay, media, we are about to begin our news conference with Miami, if you're in the back, and have an interest in the Hurricanes, they will be here in just seconds. Okay, we are ready to begin with the Hurricanes of Miami. Our student athletes are, move my paper, Jordan Miller, Anthony Walker, and Isaiah Wong. Who wants to go first for our student athletes? Okay, guys on your right. Daniel Gautier, Kate, you in Houston. For each of you, you guys answer in your own way. How do you guys relish an opportunity to go up against a team that 
prides itself on the physicality, defensive, rebounding, and all that sort of stuff. How do you, when you see them, what, what do you see? What are the challenges that they pose? Was that for anybody in particular? I'm, uh, why don't we start with Jordan, and then we'll work our way down, OK? Jordan? Yeah, um, they're a physical team. Um, but you know, there's a lot of physical teams in the ACC, too. Um, obviously, we've never played them. They're number one seed for a reason. Um, but you know, with the preparation time that we've had, you know, we feel like we're we're pretty well prepared. Um, obviously, there's going to be in-game adjustments that need to be done, um, but that's just basketball. So you know, we're just focusing on coming out, playing our game, and adjusting if if need. Yeah, I feel the same way, man. I mean, we have preparation that we that we've been going over. We'd like to think we're a scrappy physical team ourselves. So it's going to be a good game. We worked hard. We got we got a game plan for them, and we'll see what happens Monday night. Yeah, like you said, they're a physical team. I feel like we got, for us in that game, we just got to play physical too and just match the energy. And I feel like our one through five is the same as their one through five. So we just play the same as energy and we we have a good game. Media listening in on Zoom, uh, remember to use the uh, raise hand function to signal that you have a question and we will come to you. Other questions for the three guys? Okay, we'll go toward the left, toward the back of the room. Hey, Jordan, Eric Olson, Associated Press. Uh, kind of off the wall here. How often do you guys uh, encounter people saying, hey, Miami, that's a football school? And, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, we hear that a lot. Um, I mean, the best way to deal with it is to just come out, win basketball games, and say this all the time. Uh, the best way to get recognition is to, to win something, um, whether that's games, championships, conference championships, you name it. Um, the best thing that we can do to get recognition instead of asking for it is to do something about it. You know what I mean? Okay, on the extreme right. Uh, Todd Palmer, KSHB 41 here in Kansas City. Isaiah, I wanted to ask, Nigel coming in, you know, he's moving from shooting guard to point guard. What was that relationship like? And and Coach Larnega kind of said, you guys hit it off real quick. So can you give me any insight into why you guys hit it off so quick and why you guys have kind of thrived together? Um, I feel like for Nigel, he's a great player to play play um, play with. He's an easygoing person, and he can um, transition in any role he plays in. Just, um, he, he came in just, a, like you said, he was a scoring guard, and he came in, played point guard very easily. The transition was very easy. Yeah, he had a lot of players like me, Jordan, Norche, and, and Wilga to pass the ball around. And I feel like we're, we're making his job easy, too. So the transition is with Nigel, he's just a great shooter, and he likes to pass and play defense at the other end, too. So he's, he's just been a great, great piece to the team. OK, again. Was it a good personality fit, though? I mean. Because Jim seemed to say that if the locker room and the, the chemistry you guys have personally was a big factor, too. Oh, yeah, most definitely. He's um, just a great person. Me and Nigel, we, we, we're great fan, great friends, and it's just he's just a great person to be around, an easygoing person to be around, too. And he's just fun to be around and just have – we have good times being, being, being around each other. Okay, guys, we'll go on this left side here on the aisle. Blair Kirkhoff with the Kansas City Star. Jordan, um, speaking of Nigel, his um, his NIL deal was one of the first that was got, that got a lot of publicity uh, when it happened, and, I, and it seemed to me we've heard from coaches say that you know NILs could have an effect on locker rooms or clubhouses, you know that sort of thing. I'm wondering, um, could did that happen with, with Miami with uh, you know with, with somebody who had an NIL deal as publicizes that one? Uh, I would say no to answer your question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, he's our team and everybody's happy for him. Um, we all have the same opportunity. Um, how you get that is however which way it is. Um, again, I'm just going to reiterate, everybody was happy for him. You know, there was no bad blood. Um, and the more we got to know Nigel, the more we got to see him as a person and how he is an individual basketball player. So, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's happy for whoever gets whatever, you know, NIL opportunity that comes their way. Okay, again, extreme left. Just 
following up on that, did any of you guys feel bad that he that his did get publicized and he had to answer so many questions and fairly or unfairly there were people who said he, he left K-State just for the money and things like that. So did you, did you get a sense that bothered him or did anybody feel bad that, that he had to deal with that? You want all three to respond? Yeah, okay. Respond. Let's start with Isaiah and work our way back. Um, I wasn't really focused on that topic at the time. I was just worried about basketball and all that, but I feel like that's not the – situation or answer I could answer for you? I mean, yeah, I just feel like um, he if it did bother him, he didn't show us. So, I mean, he's he's always smiles, he's always happy, he's always up. So, again, like, that's a situation I don't feel like I can answer well, but it don't look like it bothered him to me. Yeah, and it just comes with the territory. You know, there's pros and cons to everything in life. Um, so, again, like Anthony said, he handled it well. Um, I'm sure he knew a lot of questions were going to come his way. If he played bad, people were going to say negative things. But at the end of the day, all you can do is just come out and play basketball. We have roughly five minutes to go in our time frame for this interview session. Other questions? Alfred, anyone on Zoom? Not at this time. Okay. So any other questions for our student athletes from Miami? I don't see any hands, guys. You're excused. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Good yeah, luck. Thank you. Have a and good day. we will talk to you then, okay? All right. Thank you for coming. Okay. Our notice will be uh, our next interview session will begin at 110 with the Houston Cougars student athletes, okay? 110 to 125 is Houston student athletes. Then 125 to 140 will be um, Kelvin Sampson, the head coach at Houston. Okay, so we have a bit of a break. Hmm? Yeah, I think that went great. Just a back and forth like that. So yeah, I didn't have another rubber band. I don't know. Why, I don't know what I did there. Oh, you did? Okay. I went down there and got one, but the ne I can use the next team for the moment. I'll just undo Houston and.
They're bringing the whole shooting match. <laughs> Jamal Shed. A shed to put a tractor in.
Hey. Um, the water's not here. Okay, good, good, good. So I was looking in the other room. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I just sent you an email from Jennifer at the NCAA. She had some coaching points.
media in the back in the workroom that we will we're about five minutes away from the start of the Houston news conference so if you're going to cover the Cougars we'll start in about five minutes and we will start with the student athletes first And we will make this announcement for the benefit of our stenographer team, if you're listening. Not sure if you are, but if you are. Our student athletes from Houston will be Jamal Shedd, Marcus Sasser, Truman Mark, Jarris Walker, and Jawan Roberts. Here's a note for uh, broadcast media, TV media, uh, satellite coordinates for uh, the entire tournament. Galaxy 17, K16, slot A. The downlink is 12006.5V as in Victor. Okay? If you have a question, just see the people at Hammond or come back up here and uh, we'll repeat that for you. So in theory, we're about two minutes away. No, uh, they, they changed it. We want players. For media filing into the interview room as a courtesy to your fellow media members, as well as the coaches and the student athletes, please silence your cell phones. You've done that a thousand times. Uh, when you ask your question, wait for the microphone to come to you. We have Addie on my left, Rachel on my right. And please state your name and affiliation. Tell us who you are and where you're from each time you ask the question. And if you are on Zoom, if you're joining us on Zoom today, please use the raise hand function to alert us that you have a question and we will try to uh, get you in during this 15 minute period. Don't forget recording press conferences on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. And the Houston locker room will be open during the 30 minute period that coach and the student athletes will be on stage, okay? So don't forget about the open locker room. <clears throat> huh? Is coming? Again, media, Houston student athletes are heading this way and should start in just a bit.
Anybody wants water? No, I think we're good. <clears throat> All right, we are ready to begin with the uh, University of Houston Cougars. Uh, we will this time go with our student athletes first. We have the entire starting five for Houston. Uh, Jamal Shedd, Marcus Sasser, Tremont Mark, Jarris Walker, and Jawan Roberts. Have microphones on both sides of the room. Just let us know when you want to go and please state name and affiliation. Guys, the first question will be on your left toward the back, extreme left. Byron Metcalf, ESPN. What's up, fellas? Uh, Jamal and Marcus, can you just talk about the progression of you know, your injuries and how you're feeling now, now that you've had some time to rest? Um, I've just been doing a good job, you know, getting treatment, uh, massaging, stretching. Um, I've been healing, you know, good. Um, i say I'll probably be around 90%, you know, by Friday. So I've been getting healthy. Uh, mine was pretty just a bang up. So uh, I'm back 100% just these couple of days. Uh, to, to recover back pretty good. Okay, let's go on the right side now. Daniel Gotera, KHU in Houston. For each of you, uh, if you can each answer this, what is your favorite Coach Sampson one-liner? I know he's got a lot. During the press conferences, he drops them all the time. So you guys think, what does he, what does he tell you guys? What's your favorite saying that he has? <laughs> I think we are going to start with Jawan and then work our way back. Jawan, you get you get to go first. <laughs> Can you come back to me? <laughs> um, I'll go with uh, softer than puppy poop in the rain. <laughs> um, okay. Nothing's been taught till it's been learned. Something like that, yeah. And none has been learned until it's been taught. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, Jamal will run through a brick wall, but it's only <laughs> one question here to ask. Um, do I get a head start? Hey, yeah, Jamal, it's your turn. I don't know, bro. That's not a lot. No, I know you got a good one, bro. Nah, bro, because it's just like he be saying it got a lot. I don't, got a lot. I don't really need to think about him. I don't think he makes you just think about him, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't got one off the top. You stumped the band right off yeah, the top. Yeah, I don't got one off the top. Okay, next question. I think we have one here. Here on the, the right side, on the aisle. Chris Gardner, Houston Rumbar. If you, Jarris, now the tournament has started. Have, are you playing any more locked in defensively? Um, I mean, I guess you could say that. I mean, I don't like to try to change game from game. I try to stay solid. Um, just try to give my all each and every half. I mean, obviously I had a pretty good defensive game last outing, but I feel like that was just due to how hard I was playing. I mean, our back against the wall, we didn't want the season to end, so I guess we kind of all gave it everything we had uh, that, that second half. Okay, here on the left side, on the front. Dennis, Dennis Nellipane from Fox 7 Austin Sports. Jamal, we remember you from high school, from Maynard, doing big things in the postseason. Here you do big things in the postseason. What is it about your makeup uh, that makes you built for – the biggest stage? Uh, I just say not really wanting to go home. You know, you realize that when you get to the postseason that those games can be your last game. So I'm um, just, you know, rising to the occasion and not wanting to go home. Okay, left side toward the back. Myron Metcalf, ESPN again for Juwan and Tremon. What has it been like as you know, Coach Samson has gone through the loss of his sister and kind of dealing with that tragedy. What has that been like for you all as players and for him as well? Juwan, why don't you go first? Um, I would just say, you know, is you know, deeper than basketball. You know, um, once you lose a loved one, you know, it's never easy. And um, just going through that time and um, just knowing, you know, how much love Coach Samson had for her. And, um, you know, with that just happening, it just really made us sit down and just, you know, embrace what we have, you know, together. And um, just know that, you know, anything can happen any day. You know, tomorrow's never promised. So um, just being with these guys on my left, um, I just feel like everything I do from this day on, you know, I just do it out of love, 
you know, because you never know when I'll be with these guys, you know, after this or whatever. So just going through that time, you know, I just feel like everybody had to really settle in and just embrace everything that we have right now, um, knowing that, you know, if it doesn't go the way we want it to go, you know, this will never be the same team again. You know, we're going to all split up, have different paths. And I just feel like, you know, with that happening, it just all brought us a little closer, you know. And um, I love these guys, you know, and I know they love me. And that's just how we is, you know, as a family, on and off the court. So um, we're just going to ride this wave out, you know, as long as we can and just stay together. Uh, it just makes you think, you know, like Coach Sampson gives his all every day for us. So. I just think it's only right for us to give our all for him and all the things he's been through, all the things he's done for us throughout the season. It's only right that we uh, continue to go out and, and play hard for him and for ourselves. Again, a reminder, if you're listening in on Zoom, please raise your hand function to signal that you have a question. Okay, extreme left. That's not CBS Sports. Um, following up on what Jawan said, you know, there's getting to the Final Four, there's winning a national championship, but you guys could do it in your hometown. What, what's the word here? Is it pressure? Is it anticipation? Um, do you feel it from home? Because people have been talking about it all year. Maybe just uh, Marcus and, and Jamal. Um, I'd say just more anxious. Uh, we understand what's at stake, and we know what's at home, but, uh, you know, you got to win to get there. So that's why our focus has been on this next game because, you know, Miami's not a pushover. So, um, you know, our focus has been on the next game. We understand what's at stake, but we, we have the right focus right now. Um, yeah, kind of just like he said, you know, we're taking it game by game, one game at a time. Um, really try not to worry about it too much. Just really be where your feet are. And, you know, we got two more games, but, you know, we really don't even look at it like that. You know, we just look at the next game. And um, if you handle business, next thing you know, you'll be where you want to be. So really just being where our feet are. Swing back to the right here on the aisle. Chris Gardner, Houston Rombar Review. For all of you, what challenges does Miami present for you guys individually and as a team? Um, they're really good at what they do. You know, they're a really, really good offensive team. Uh, everybody on their team can score the ball in a variety of ways. They can really shoot the ball. Like, like I said, they're just a really good offensive team. Uh, they offensive rebound. They get out and run. And uh, – Everything that they do, you know, they do it at a good pace, and they know how to play with each other, and they play well together. Basically, everything you said, um, they're very consistent, you know, very active on defense, um, really like to run in transition, and um, they, you know, they all play good together. Fast-paced team, you know, they like to get out, shoot threes, so we just got to, you know, do what we usually do, just get out to the shooters and guard the, guard the ball the way we usually do, and I think we'll be in a good spot. Okay, our next question on the aisle again, on the right. Mark Berman from Fox Houston. Jamal, I'll start with you and Marcus and all you guys. What does it mean to you, all five of you, that y'all have captured the attention of the city of Houston? Jamal, we'll start with you, and then we work our way to the end. Uh, you know, they've been behind us uh, all year and uh, showing love. But, you know, the more you win, the more love you'll get. So um, that goes with, you know, whatever sport, whatever you do in life. The more successful you are, the more love you'll get. So they've been behind us. And uh, it's just been really awesome to, you know, feel the love of the city. Yeah, they've been supporting us, you know, since day one, really. So just to see them always having our back, um, traveling like this out here. Um, and we be needing it sometimes, you know. We need that energy, um, especially when other teams go on runs and stuff like that. So we need them for sure. Uh, it's been good, you know, the whole season, really, just the energy they provided for us throughout all these games and it's definitely key here throughout these next these next games that we'll be we'll be having. Uh I just love our fans and the things they've done for us. Um it just means a lot. I mean that they're willing to obviously come to the games at Vertita in Houston. I mean Austin Fort Worth, but I mean also take the time to travel. I mean I know they have busy schedules as well, but I mean they travel with us, um, show their love and support. So I mean it means the world that uh we have the ability to show out for them. Basically everything they said, um, just being very supportive. You know, every role game that we play, you know, we look in the crowd and there's only a portion of 
<clears throat> Houston fans. You know, so it just shows all the dedication, you know, that they put in, all the time that they invest into us. And um, they try as much to, you know, travel in packs. And, um, you know, that's what we need, you know. And I always say, you know, we all we got. So just stick together. Okay, we have roughly four minutes to go in this interview session. And if you want to ask a question on Zoom, please raise your hand on the Zoom function and let us know. Any other questions here in the room? Guys here on the extreme left toward the back. Uh, Myron Mack, VSPF for all five guys. What's your pregame song on your playlist that you go to when you're trying to get ready for a game? Let's start with Jawan on this one and come back toward me. Um, I got a variety of artists that I listen to, but my go-to is, I would say, Meek Mill, just of the motivational purposes in his songs. Um, yeah. Pre-game. Pre-game, I don't got a song, but I'll probably go with Rilo or G Herbo. They both get me started. Do y'all even know who that is? No. No Rilo? Oh. You do? Y'all not going to know mom, but he go by the name of <laughs> go by the name of Bees. He real good. That's mine. Uh, I'll probably be listening to Lil Baby or Gunna, okay. one of them. Mine's kind of slow. Like, I go Rilo over Drake. <laughs> Other questions for the guys? No one on Zoom, I don't think. No, they're in. Okay, Thank no you. one left in the room. So, guys, we're going to let you uh, get out of here. Thank you. Start thinking about the game tomorrow as if you're not already. So, thank you for coming, and we will see you in about, I don't know, 24 hours or so. Thanks. Oh, the coach is heading this way. All right, we are now joined by the head coach at the University of Houston, Kelvin Sampson. Coach, we'll turn to you first for an opening statement and then go to questions to our, with our media audience. Coach? Um, Steph uh, never gets old. I think coaching in the uh, NCAA tournament for uh, basketball is 
every kid's dream. They grow up watching it, and then when they get in it, it's um, the emotions of playing in it. You know, gives you. A, there's nothing that gives you a chance to be a, a goat and a hero in the same um, sentence as the NCAA tournament. Um, there's already been so many fantastic stories. Um, and I'm excited about our guys. You know, we came here last year and um, four seniors that were a big part of who we were. We lost those four seniors. And now we had to start over. <clears throat> Two kids were coming off major surgeries and um, Shaman Mark, Marcus Sasser. And then we um, brought a kid that came off the bench last year, Jaywan Roberts. And then uh, we had three freshmen. Jairus Walker, Emmanuel Sharp, and Terrence Arsenault. Kind of threw them together, mixed them up with Rangy Chaney, a little dose of uh, Javier Francis. Um, and we developed a, uh, we became a good team. Um, one of the things that this, this team learned to do along the way was uh, how to win. Everybody wants to win, but you know, how are you going to win? And once we figured that out, um, you know, our leadership took over. Uh, Marcus Sasser, Jamal Shedd, uh, those kids um, are, are, are great leaders. That's one of the great things about our program over the years is we've always had great player leadership. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we've been uh, successful. Hey, thank you, Coach. A reminder, everyone, the Houston locker room is open for another 12, 13 minutes. If you have a question on Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature to signal that you have a question. Coach, your first question will be on the left in the back, on the left side. Meyer Metcalf, ESPN. Uh, Coach, uh, it's a, a low for the last 10 years in terms of three-point shooting through the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, 31.2% overall. Uh, any idea why that's happened and what you would attribute that to? How about uh, attempts and makes. The percentage is skewed sometimes based on how many attempts and makes you have. Do you know you know what those are? Um, well, if we're shooting a particularly low percentage, it's probably the guys that can't shoot doing most of the shooting. You know, I'm not real smart, but I figured that out. It's like free throw percentage. You know, people say, well, Coach, uh, uh, why don't y'all work on shooting free throws? Oh, we do. You know, we're not very smart. We figured that out. Um, but if your worst free throw shooters are shooting most of your free throws, you're going to have a low, lower free throw percentage, right? No difference in the three-point line. I think some, some coaches are uh, – uh, uh, more and more coaches are fine with um, anybody shooting them. But sometimes that's the best shot you're going to get. And they also create long rebounds, which are more 50-50 balls. You know, the closer, the closer in you shoot the ball, uh, the more likely you are to have defined blockouts. But when uh, you move the ball around, you get in the paint, you kick it out, which is where a lot of the threes come from, right? And you shoot it. Um, um, you may kick it to a guy that's not necessarily a good shooter, and he may not know it. <laughs> but he's open, right? What do they say? Well, coach, I was open. And then what does the coach say? Well, you're always open for a reason, son. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. But I, I know what you're saying, uh, uh, Myron. I don't overreact to those things because it's all cyclical anyway. Other questions for coach? I think we have one here on the front. Second row, actually, on the aisle. Go ahead. Coach, Chris Gardner, Houston Ron Bar Review. Just a little bit off topic. Just what are your thoughts on Willis Reed and his passing? Another icon. Um, Willis Reed <clears throat> wasn't the greatest NBA player ever, um, but he might have been the greatest um, leadership center. He and, he and Bill Russell, when you, you look at these last two, icons from the NBA, uh, Bill Russell and Willis Reed, and what they're remembered most by. Not their stats. Most people don't really remember what 
Willis Reed did, but they remember that he won. And I, and I think that's a great legacy for Willis. You know, uh, being in the NBA for six years, you get to know all those guys, Oscar, Willis, Walt Frazier, Elgin Baylor, Bill Russell, um, Jerry West. You know, that was a, a, a special era for me because I was a little boy growing up in that era. Um, in 1970, when he came out, was it game six or game, no, game seven, right? When he came out to, in the garden, and um, I mean, guys, guys are out for two months with that injury now. They wouldn't even think of uh, finding a way to come out on the floor, but he did. And uh, Coach Holtzman with uh, that team, uh, DeBusher, Bradley, um, Frazier, that was a great team, man. Barnett, that was a great team, but Willis Reed. And I always appreciated him how he was an advocate for HBCUs. You know, the H HBCUs, um, uh, when you have Willis Reed being a graduate and being an advocate, uh, that's a good thing. So, uh, rest in peace, big man. Um, your legacy is secured. <clears throat> Next question on coach's left. Hey, Coach Todd Palmer, KSHB here in Kansas City. Um, I know you've obviously got more important things to worry about than next year uh, at this point, but uh, the Big 12 tournament is, is in Kansas City and will be for a few more years. Is there any significance to, to playing here and, and, and you know, being a part of the basketball community here? Well, I've played in Kansas City in the Big 12 tournament a lot of years. Um, I think there's a reason why it's here. Um, you know, we're, I was in the first group that would move to American Airline Arena. How long has it been back here? For a while? Yes, sir. 08. 08. Because I remember um, we went to the Final Four in 02, and I think the next year was in, in Dallas. Um, that was, um, you know, if you're in Oklahoma and Texas school, you, you'd like it in Dallas. But if you're, uh, I was part of the old Big Eight. It probably tells you it's about time to leave, isn't it? <laughs> that you're still in, you remember the old Big Eight with um, Danny Knee and Norm Stewart, Roy. Let's see if I remember those guys. Eddie, Norm, Roy, Danny. Um, what schools am I forgetting? Kansas State was uh, Tom Asbury. Iowa State was uh, Tim Floyd. No, Ricardo wasn't. He wasn't. Wasn't it? Uh, was it Harrington that first year? I think so. Um, and then uh, me and Oklahoma. That was the uh, Big Eight. I think we we're together for three years, right, Blair? Yeah. You haven't changed much. <laughs> I haven't changed much, man. I, I feel, still feel like this is uh, um, Oklahoma and somebody. Blair Kerr, back, back here in Kansas City. But back then it was old Kemper. I went into Kemper Arena uh, this summer, and I was just uh, in awe of what they've done to that place. It was a, there was a recruiting event there. It was amazing. I said, first time I ever was in Kemper, I watched uh, – Wisconsin Stevens Point with Terry Porter versus uh, Southwest Oklahoma with Dennis Rodman. I watched that game. That was in 1983, 84, something like that. Um, and they had a, uh, a a restaurant outside that had a cow with big horns. Yeah, and I never had enough money. I was an NAI guy. I just never had enough money. And I said, you know, one of these years, if I ever get enough money, um, I'm going to take my family in there, but uh, I never have. They still have it. They still have that restaurant. Well, I got enough money now. <laughs> I can't, I just don't have the time. Back then, back then, you know, I had time. I just, you know, I was more of a uh, McDonald's Burger King guy because I could always get a number, number seven or something. I, I could afford that. 
Okay, question in the back again. Uh, Kelvin, your, your player said, you know, the loss of your sister kind of brought the team closer, kind of realizing how precious life is. What has this been like for you coaching on the biggest stage, uh, but also dealing with one of the biggest losses of your life as well? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we all have self-talk where we just kind of, um, I, I didn't want to make this about me. I didn't want to bring any attention to that. Um, I have a, um, we were getting ready for the East Carolina game, and I was in the hotel when my youngest sister, who lives in Phoenix, called me that morning. But I, I've been talking to her, to her every day, and um, <clears throat> I knew that it was going to come sooner. But I, I also know that um, the uh, minister that the guy that did my mother's eulogy says something that, that was really hit home with me is that you know God's a merciful God when he takes him when he does. You know, and that was time. Hey, here on the front. Calvin Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports. Um, pardon me if this has been asked, but the fact that you guys could play at home next week do you use it as motivation, or are you telling these guys, put it out of your mind, we got work to do? Neither one. Okay. I, I never think about it. I literally don't. Probably everybody does but me. I don't care. I'm not most people. You know, I don't march to anybody's drummer but mine. I, I literally do not get influenced by other people. Um, um, you know, our, our record says 33-3. and three. But that has been a really struggling 33 and three. We've struggled a lot this year. You know, we've uh, that Auburn game probably was a um, capsule of our season more than anything else. Been really difficult for us to put two halves together. You know, uh, we have at times, but I think when you play as many freshmen as we do, uh, Dennis, um, um, Walker, Arsenal, um, Francis. Think of all of our bench guys, basically. Javier Francis is 19 years old, Walker's 19, Arsenault, and uh, Sharp. That's four of our top um, eight are uh, in Cheney. So four of our top nine are freshmen. That, that's going to lend to inconsistency. You know, last year, um, we had four starters that were all either grad students. Uh, shoot, we had one kid in their sixth year, Tajay Moore. He was a six-year guy. They were the fourth, fifth, or sixth year. This year, they're all first-year guys. You know, we're not a 33 and, you know, a dominant team. You know, um, I've had teams, uh, people say, well, this is your best team. Well, that's your opinion. The only person's opinion that matters on that is mine because I coached them all. You know, I probably better feel whether this is the best team or not. Uh, and it's not. This has not been our best team. Um, uh, two years ago, we went to the Final Four. Um, I thought that was a really good team, but I didn't think that team was better than Baylor. Baylor was better than us, you know. And I've I've always been brutally honest with that stuff. If you ask me about a team, I'll say I'll tell you whether I think we're better than them. But we weren't better than Baylor uh, last year, though. I didn't think there was a great team, you know. Um, Baylor's the best team we, I've seen in eight years or nine years now. Um, Kansas won it, but that's, that wasn't Bill's best team. Bill's had some great teams. But that tells you about college basketball last year. Um, uh, Kansas was really, really good. So was North Carolina. Uh, so was Villanova. Villanova's best player got hurt in the last two minutes, I think, of our game. I uh, can't remember his name, um, but he was really good. They could have won it. I thought we were good enough to win it last year. Uh, Villanova was, Kansas was, North Carolina was. Um, and I think the same thing this year. I don't think there's a great team this year. I think there's a lot of good ones, and I think we're one of them. But uh, we're not special. You know, we're not, you look at us and say, well, they're really good. No, we're down 10 our last game. You know, uh, we struggled against Northern Kentucky. You know, now we've looked good at times. Um, but um, but we're not a team where you sit and start thinking about next week. <laughs> you know, we're 40 minutes away from going home. You know, that's reality. A lot of people don't like to hear that, but they'll get over it. You know, 
we play good tomorrow, we've got a chance to win. If we don't, we'll go home, and that's just the way it is. Hasn't changed and since this tournament started. That's why you don't ever prepare um, um, for next week. You prepare for it logistically, um, but um, these games are hard to win, man. Look at the teams that are home. Ask them how hard it is to win in the tournament. It's just it's difficult. That's why it's a blessing to still be here. Okay, we are out of time for this segment for um, Coach. We'll say good luck tomorrow, and we okay, will see you then. Guys. Thank you. I did your games back in the day. You did? Yeah, so we're back.
media covering Xavier. Uh, the Musketeers will be here in about two minutes or so. Actually, the head coach, Sean Miller, he will go first, followed by the student athletes in the second session for Xavier. Don't forget the Xavier locker room will be open during the time frame that the Musketeers are on the dais. So it will be open for a 30 minute period. Another reminder, recording press conferences on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. We appreciate your cooperation. When you ask your question, we have microphones on both sides of the room. Addie is on my left. Rachel's on the right, so just signal us and uh, we'll get the microphone over there. Lights are bright, but they're not that bright. We'll, we'll be able to see you. And please remember to state name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. Time frame here for the Xavier coach is from 150 to 205 followed by the uh, student athletes from Xavier, 205 to 220. <clears throat> And for the broadcasters in the room, uh, satellite coordinates, Galaxy 17, K16 slot A. The downlink is 12006.5 V as in Victor. <clears throat> yes, sir, I'm ready. We are now joined by Coach uh, Sean Miller from, ex from um, <clears throat> Xavier University. Coach, welcome to Kansas City. And an uh, opening statement before we go to questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like everybody who's uh, still playing, we're, we're thrilled to be here, thrilled to be in Kansas City, um, excited for our team and coaching staff. But I'm really excited for Xavier University. It's a fantastic place that – sometimes has an understated tradition when it comes to this tournament. You know, at one point, uh, our program went to 16 of 18 NCAA tournaments. That's very difficult to do, and uh, we're thrilled to be back in it. Let's go to questions. First one here is on the left. Myron McCaff, ESPN. Uh, Sean, when there's a coaching change, especially in this area, a lot of players will transfer. That's something that new coaches have to deal with. What did you – say to these guys after they won the NIT to convince most of those guys to come back and join you? You know, Myron, I think it's a testament to just Xavier as a university. Uh, obviously, we talked to everybody, and uh, we also talked to their families. It didn't take a lot of convincing. I think that, that the guys, our players, knew that we, uh, we had the opportunity to do something special. I also think because I had been at Xavier before, that I had a different type of credibility. There's a lot of people that they know that either I had coached or been in the Cintas Center and been in NCAA tournaments with previous Xavier teams. So I think that helped a lot as well. Okay, on the coach's right. Adam Baum, Cincinnati Enquirer. Sean, you've been to the second weekend before, but you're, the guys on your team have not. How do you walk them through 
the magnitude of this moment and help them sort of understand it and deal with it the right way. Well, that's that's the the great part about this tournament. You know, that's as important as uh, anything, the preparation for the game, et cetera, the scouting. You know, it's so much, I think, more important that the team that, that we are, that, you know, you do what you do. And that There's a reason that we're here. There's a reason that we even made the NCAA tournament. It's those things that you want to be razor sharp and be at your best at when you get to this round. Uh, my experience, I think the first game, the magnitude of actually the start of the tournament, especially if you're favored or you're the higher seed, uh, sometimes it can work against you. We dealt with that a little bit uh, last week. But uh, my hope is that you play two games and get to this round, although it is big. Um, guys now have tournament experience. They've been through it. Uh, they've traveled uh, to a city already. I think this time around, from, from that perspective, I think is somewhat easier. At least I hope so. Okay, now on the aisle. Uh, Mike, Mike Finger, San Antonio Express News. Sean, speaking of your experience in this tournament, I know it probably seems like a lifetime ago, but what do you remember about the, the drama of the, of the last time you played Texas in 2011 in, in Tulsa? And, and do you think that defending the inbounder will play as big of a role this time as it did last time? Yeah, so you're talking about when I was a coach at Arizona? Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh... That was a, a big a, that was a big moment. You're right. I actually forgot about that. Uh, great game. Um, if you think about the players that were in that game, you know a lot of them went on and had great careers in the NBA. Both teams. And uh, but I think that game was always a reminder for me of you know you advance. It's like you did it, and you don't advance. Sometimes you can really feel like a failure. And in that particular game, that was it was almost like a, like a single moment that differentiated going to the Sweet 16 and not. And then, you know, once we got to the Sweet 16 that year, we caught fire and uh, we beat Duke and then lost in a thrilling game to UConn, who went on to win the national championship. So, um, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing game. Do you remember the five-second call in that game? I do. I thought he got the call perfect. <laughs> it, five and a half is what I had it at. Media, if you're joining us on Zoom, please use the raise hand function to signal that you have a question. We'll stay in the room here, go on coach's right on the aisle. Cincinnati Enquirer. Sean, I've heard you say, do what we do a lot. And I think that was something that you brought to Xavier the first time. What, what's the backstory with that? Why is that such an important message that, that you give to your team so often? You know, it's just, it, we can control that. You know, it's, it's hard to control what other teams are doing in, in their programs. Everybody has their own way, but this is our way. And I think the more that we're all united and on the same page of this is what we do, these are the things that are important, this is how we practice, these are, are the things that we hold sacred. When everybody's united for that, um, I believe that you have a chance to overall be the best that you can be. And, you know, when you're constantly trying for excellence, you know, that's, it starts with you. And that also, I think in our world today, it, it always points the compass back at the things that we can control. Today's practice, you know, yesterday's weight lift, the preparation for the game, the way we warm up, uh, all those types of things, uh, trying to keep the focus on, on our process. So maybe that's a different way of saying the same thing. Let's go in the back in front of the TV camera. Hey, Sean. Uh, Eric Olson with the Associated Press. I uh, wanted to ask you uh, about Sully. Uh, when, when you got him here, did you expect him to make this big of a contribution? Uh, and can you just put into perspective exactly what he's meant to, to this team this year? Yeah, it was around this time uh, we, we began to, to recruit Sully uh, once he was in the last year's uh, transfer portal. Uh, we knew a lot of different people that knew him. Uh, one of the things that helped me is uh, he played at UTEP. Ironically, Rodney was uh, was his coach, and uh, I was the coach at Arizona. And, you know, you scout a team, you prepare for them, and then you play against the team. I think you have a pretty good feel for players and different things. So uh, we had a great sense, and then uh, that firsthand experience, I think, really allowed me to feel good about him. Could I have projected that he would be a first-team All-Big East player and have the meaning that he's had for our team? No way. Uh, not that I didn't think he was as good as he is. He's just been 
he's been a super player for us. I mean, I'm sure if you talk to the other coaches in the Big East, they'll tell you that he's a big difference in our, in our team. So um, I'm thrilled for him. A lot of the things that we talked to Sule about a year ago that we thought could come true have come true for him. And he had a great opportunity, and he's really he's taken advantage of that opportunity. His story is remarkable when you think about where he came from, how long he's been playing. And sometimes when we talk about how many points he scored, I mean, he scored – in his college career, over 2,400 points. That's a lot of points. There aren't too many guys that have played college basketball that have scored that many. So we really believe in him. Uh, I'm sure Rodney Terry believes in him. He, he, uh, you know, he coached him, and uh, I know that he thinks the world of Sule as well. Great kid, amazing kid, and that's the other part of Sule. He came to us for all the right reasons, and he's meshed with the group and our team in our university in almost like a seamless way, as if he has been with us longer than a year. And uh, it's going to be sad when he goes. We'll stay in the back and move to Coach's right. Coach, uh, Sam Lance with Adam Zagori and Zags blog. On the same subject of the transfer portal, it's obviously very important nowadays in roster building. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, how staying in the NCAA tournament could be a disadvantage to recruiting the portal there are guys that are in the portal now even committing while you guys are still playing basketball. just want to know your thoughts. Yeah, no, no, I totally respect your question. I, I, I get it. Uh, but there, there's nothing that allows you to be more successful in the future than winning. And advancing in this tournament supersedes any phone call that I can make because uh, we can talk about it, but when, you, when you're doing it, I think there's a different credibility. And also, whether uh, you know whether you like it or not, uh, it's it's the new way. So it's not as if we can't communicate while we're here too. So you kind of wear two hats. But uh, I do respect your question. It is unique. Um, a few years back, this nece- wouldn't necessarily be the case. But I think all of us have to adjust, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, toward the back. Sean, Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Uh, what, in as much detail as you like here, what has it been like to have this rare experience of returning to a place after more than a decade, you know? Yeah, it, you know, Chuck, it's, it's very unique. Uh, it is. You know, the last time that my wife and I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, we had three young sons. Uh, I went to soccer games, Little League baseball games. I watched one of my sons get stuck in center field fence. His foot got stuck, and they ran like a – could have run about six home runs around while I had to walk out there and get his foot out of the fence. I won't, I won't tell you which one of my three sons, but uh, when I think back to our first days, the last time in Cincinnati, it was an eight-year period with small children, all three sons, raising them and coaching. This time, uh, 13 years later, all three of them are out of the house. You know, one of them is an attorney. One of them's part of our staff, and my third son is a student at Arizona. So it's just my wife and I, and that in and of itself is a lot different. Some of our uh, biggest supporters and friends that I used to see all the time in Cincinnati the last time, they now live in Florida. <laughs> Imagine that. You know, they, they come back and forth. But I'll also tell you there's a lot of similarities. You know, Xavier, what it stands for, the passion for college basketball hasn't changed. As a matter of fact, now that we're in the Big East Conference, the last time I was there, we were in the Atlantic 10. You know, I'd say there might even be more passion towards, towards our team in the college basketball season. So, um, but very familiar with the, the area and me and my wife both growing up in Pittsburgh. Cincinnati and Pittsburgh have some similarities. Less, less than three minutes to go in this interview session. We'll go here on the left. Sean, there was a game in November when Jerome Hunter played just four minutes, I guess. I think it was against Indiana. He's averaging 29 minutes a game, 19 points a game. What has he meant to this team since the Zach Fremantle injury? And do you get here without Jerome Hunter stepping up the way that he did? No, I mean, Myron, you're, you're, you're really spot on. Um, I, I would tell you that Jerome is, is like a throwback story. It, there used to be stories like him all throughout this tournament where – you kind of earn your stripes. You have a smaller role. You do it well. You make it bigger. You do that well. 
and then all of a sudden circumstances in your good play allow you to have the role that you, you really hoped for. And then, then you start getting better at that role, and all of a sudden you become a very good player. And that's exactly what, what he did. In November was our roughest moment, him trying to adapt to a new coach, a new style, figure out what we were asking for. But to his credit, when he figured it out, he made it his job on a daily basis. And Jerome is one of our best practice players. I've never seen a guy who shows up every day in practice and gets it done. It eventually not translate into a game. And all those things are who he is. And if there's one player that I would point to kind of that you want to embody a culture of, of a team or a program, it would be Jerome because he just simply plays to win. And everybody in our locker room knows it. He knows it. And uh, I'm just incredibly happy for him. And as a coach, I'm very proud of what he's become because, no, we would not be here today without him. One last question here on Coach's Right. Paul Fritschner, Big East Digital Network. Sean, the Big East has three teams in the second weekend, uh, UConn, Creighton being the other two. And you're four and one against those teams this year. So how impressed are you with the performance of the conference this year? And how much confidence does it give you to see how you've done against that competition? No doubt. The Big East Conference is one of America's best. Um, this year in particular, Paul, as you know, and I don't know if enough people have talked about it, we've played 10 home games and 10 road games. Not only is it very, very competitive, but the 20-game schedule I think is tough into all of us. You add in three more games that we played in Madison Square Garden, you know, that's 23 games against Big East competition. I will tell you this, uh, it's no secret, you play Creighton, you play UConn, they're going to be really tough to beat. Both teams are excellent, and uh, I could see both of those teams being able to get to the Final Four. Okay, Coach, thank you so much. Yep. I'll thank let you. you. Go, I think to practice is your next thing. So good luck tomorrow, and we will see you then. Thank you, Coach. Don't forget, the um, Xavier locker room is open uh, for about another 15 minutes. So if you need a, additional student athletes, uh, you should be able to find them there. We'll start here shortly with these four student athletes from Xavier. They haven't made it to the back yet, but um, our lineup includes uh, Sule Boom, Colby Jones, Adam Kunkel, and Jack Nunji. Media joining us on Zoom, if you have a question, just signal the uh, raise hand feature or use the raise hand feature to um, let us know that you have a question. So happy to get you on if you something pops in that you want to ask.
Um, Xavier student athletes will be 15 minutes and it will conclude at 220. Okay, the student athletes are heading this way. We good, guys? If you need something, just let me know. Okay, I got you. Okay. I think we are ready to go with the Musketeers from Xavier. Our student athletes, we have four. Uh, Sule Boom, Colby Jones, Adam Kunkel, and Jack Nunji. Guys, first question is going to be in the back, in front of the TV camera. Sule, uh, Eric, Eric Olson with the Associated Press. I uh, wanted to ask you, you, you had said a while back that you came to Xavier because you wanted to play in the NCAA tournament. Uh, so far, how's, has it been what you envisioned it to be? And uh, just uh, if you could comment a little bit on how, how things have gone for you uh, individually. Yeah, I mean, it's been a dream come true, man. I still, I'm still, I still can't believe that I'm up here today uh, with these guys, but um, it's just been a dream come true and I'm happy that I'm here. This is what I came here for and um, it just shows that all the stuff, all the work that we put in all year, all the games that we won, all the all the teams that we competed against. I mean, we just we just re getting all the benefits of that, and um, I'm just happy and delighted that I'm here with these guys, and we we still standing in the Sweet 16, having a chance to get to the lead A. So I know I'm gonna do everything possible. I know these guys are gonna do everything possible to uh, do our best so we can get there. Okay, question here on the right side on the aisle. Adam Baum, Cincinnati Enquirer. Sule, you're going against your, your former coach. Um, what What is that dynamic like in this game? And have you talked to him at all since this matchup got set? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's crazy because um, it just shows you how everything comes full circle. Uh, I'm about to play against my old coach. I played for him. I played for him for three years. Um, we have a great relationship. Um, and I know he cares about me. I care about him. And uh, we we've communicated. We communicated throughout the year. Uh, he texted me a couple times this week, um, even before our last game. He was just telling me that he's happy, happy for me. He's proud of me. Uh, just he's 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 been pulling for me to, throughout this whole year. So just the fact that um, the fact that we're about to play against each other now is just is just crazy. And um, stuff like this it rarely happens. Uh, so I'm just trying to soak it all in. Appreciate appreciate everything about it. And uh, I was uh, try to do my best to, to give him some fits tomorrow. <laughs> hey guys, we'll go on your left. Uh, Myron Metcalf, ESPN. For for all four guys, uh, how important has Jerome Hunter been since Zach went down with his injury? And would you be here without him and the way he stepped up? Let's start with Jack at the end and work our way back toward me. Uh, Jerome, he's been. Um, you know, kind of that guy for us all year, right? Like, first he came off the bench and he was huge. Like, we, we needed him out there for, for every game. And then um, he's, he's really taken his game to, I'd say, a whole nother level since he's been out, um, moved into the starting lineup. Uh, we feel like, you know, he's done a great job defensively for us, but also, you know, offensively he's a guy who we can trust when we throw it into him in the post and he's going to, you know, either score it or, or make the right play. So 
he's been uh, huge, huge, I would say. Uh, I would kind of say the same thing. He, he's definitely helped us a lot defensively, just being able to get stops and, and stack together stops. But his, his offensive game has definitely done a full 360 compared to last year. He's, he's, he's hitting shots. He's getting, getting open. He's making the right plays. Uh, he's a glue guy, and I definitely don't think we would be here without Jerome. Yeah, I mean, he's a dog. I mean, just to see the amount of work that he's put in, I'm just glad he's been able to get his uh, ability to showcase it this year. And um, I'm proud of him. He stepped up big time when Zach went down, like you said. And um, I feel like he's just elevated our team in a different way. And uh, I'm just thankful we have him. Uh, I feel like we definitely wouldn't be here without him. I mean, when Zach went out, you know, it was, it was a lot of people saying, oh, their season is over. They're not going to they're not gonna be able to go far without Zach Fremantle. So – the fact that he stepped up big time and, and had confidence in himself, and we always had confidence in him. I mean, even when he was our sixth man, he was coming in the game, he was being very productive. So the fact that he's starting and just doing the same thing has been truly amazing to see. And uh, we have all the belief and faith in him, and he's been stepping up and delivering for us. So we've been we just happy for him. And uh, like, 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 like we said, we wouldn't be here without him. <coughs> okay, in the back. Yeah, uh, Eric Olson with the Associated Press. This is for Colby and for Adam. Uh, since you guys are the old hands on the team, uh, can you can you comment a little bit on uh, the how, how Sule has elevated this this team uh, in this one year? Colby, we'll let you go first. Uh, yeah, I mean he's just been a steady presence for us. Um, definitely on the offensive end, he's getting guys in the right spots. He's getting his, but he's also included everyone on the team. And um, yeah, I feel like just we all clicked together, and Sule just kind of came in. It was in that was that fifth piece that we needed. And um, yeah, I mean, I felt like we just have the chemistry that a lot of teams don't have. We have a lot of older players that know how to play the game the right way. So um, yeah, Sule, he's just been a, a great addition for us, and um, he's one of the best PGs in the country. And he plays like it every night. Uh, I would say the same thing, along with just consistency. Uh, from the minute he stepped on our campus, he's been consistent. Uh, in, in everything he does. He, he scores the ball with the best of them, like you guys know. He passes the ball. He gets his teammates involved. Uh, he, he plays defense. He fights over ball screens. He does everything that we need. Uh, he's a great point guard, one of the best point guards I've played under. Uh, he's an older guy, so we, we kind of get along. Even off the court, we, we got a great, great camaraderie with our team. Uh, and, yeah, he, he's, he's been able to ice a bunch of games down late. He's, he's had that clutch gene in him. Uh, and we've really looked for him uh, late in games to, to keep closing out games, and, and he's came up every time we've asked him to. So, Media on Zoom, don't forget to raise your hand if you have a question. Let's go in the back on the right. Dennis Delapena from Fox 7 Austin Sports. Um, Texas comes in hot for any of the guys. What, what's, the, any, what's the main concern when you look at film of Texas uh, as far as the matchup, and, and I guess what's the key to, to walking away with the dub? This for anyone or all five or all four? Sule, why don't you take that? Um, uh, first off, looking at them, um, they're a very talented team. They're very athletic. Um, first of all, we're going to have to get back and transition. That's going to be one of the keys to the game, and we're going to have to be able to be able to box out in this, in, 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 in this tournament and in, in this game because they have a lot of guys that they sent to the glass. So, I mean, we, I mean, we can't get them easy buckets, free buckets, just – um, crashing the glass and not boxing out, missing box outs and, and giving up easy baskets and transition threes, layups and all that. So we got to be on our P's and Q's with that. Other questions? We have about three minutes to go in this session, three or four. Okay, here on the left. We'll go on the left side, then we'll go back to the right. S Sule, what's the key to being a, a steady ball handler that gets pressure and not committing a turnover? Like, is it something you work on, something you sort of – Visualize like what is the key to that? Uh, I feel like uh, just 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 being steady and confident in yourself. I mean, going through that stuff and practice all the time. We have uh, we have good scout team guys that they they pressure us a lot. So I feel like before I even see that in the game, I mean, I get that and practice a lot. Um, so they we practice we practice that a lot. So just getting familiar with that in practice just gets me ready for the game. So I feel like. That's my best answer for that. Hey guys, on your right here on the aisle, Jack. The you know you look back at your career and the adversity that you had to overcome. Did, did you always like maintain belief that that this was possible? That you might 
end up on this stage at some point? Uh, I would say yes, definitely. Um, you know, that was my, I guess, <laughs> motivation a lot. You know, whenever you're, you know, rehabbing during the COVID pandemic, you know, getting up every day is not always easy. Um, the gyms aren't always open, so you're kind of working out at home, I guess, and uh, just kind of trusting, you know, why you're doing everything that you're doing because you love the sport, you love basketball, um, you believe in yourself, and, and uh, you know, moments like this is, is what it's all about. You know, you always want to be able to make the tournament, but then also make a run in the tournament when you get there. And, and so we're just really out here trying to, trying to make the most of it and, and trying to keep this ride going. Any other questions? I don't see a hand, and no one's on Zoom, right, Alfred? Okay. That is correct. Okay. Well, guys, we'll let you uh, get out of here, go back to the locker room. I'm sure there'll be some media questions there, and get ready for practice. We will see you guys tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, media notification, our next uh, interview session will begin at 3.05, so we'll take a pretty good break, and that will be uh, Texas Student Athletes. 3.05 is our next interview session. Thank you.
Meedy, we are about two minutes away from the scheduled arrival of the uh, Texas Longhorn student athletes. Um, Timmy Allen, Marcus Carr, Brock Cunningham will be our student athletes. And then at the end of that 15 minute period, Coach Rodney Terry will be on stage. Um, if you are going to join us on Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature to signal that you have a question. Uh, I might read some uh, satellite coordinates for you. Going to be the same coordinates that um, today as all week long. The Galaxy 17 K16 slot A downlink is 12006.5V, as in Victor. <clears throat> Texas locker room will be open during this 30 minute time frame when the student athletes and coaches on stage. So if you need additional uh, student athletes or coaches, that locker room will be open during that half hour period. <clears throat> this first session with the student athletes scheduled to go until 3.20 and then Coach Terry will come in at that point from 3.20 to 3.35 and then they go to practice and that will conclude our interviews today. And we are told that Texas has left the locker room and is heading this way, so shouldn't be much longer. I saw that. Are they here? Okay, we're ready. We are ready to begin with the University of Texas. The student athletes are Timmy Allen, Marcus Carr, and Brock Cunningham. If you are listening in on Zoom and you wish to ask a question to our student athletes, just use the raise your hand feature and that'll let us know that you have a question. All right, questions here in the room. Who wants to go first for the Longhorns? On the right side, you're right. Craig White, Longhorn Radio Network. I, so you three guys were up there last week in Des Moines, does this part of it get old? I mean, I know the playing doesn't get old, but going through all of these kinds of stuff, Brian? Uh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it. You know, you just you come to play the games as part of it, so just I haven't put much thought into that. Do you want Marcus to answer? Okay, Marcus. Okay, we're good. Next question, Cedric here in the middle. Cedric Golden, Austin, American Statesman. Um, Marcus, what can you tell us about Xavier? And um, you guys have talked a lot about how the alumni have been really instrumental in supporting you. Uh, how cool has that been in this process? Uh, Xavier is a really good team. Obviously, they wouldn't be here if they weren't. Um, great offensive team, likes to push the pace. They can shoot the ball well. 
Um, they have an inside presence as well. So, you know, they're a pretty good team. That's why they're here. And just going to do a good job of preparing for them. But as far as, you know, getting the love from fans and the alumni, you know, that's been super surreal. Obviously having guys like, you know, KD and LaMarcus tweet about, you know, us, the team, and what's going on has been super cool. Um, we're definitely out there playing for each other, but also playing to make them proud as well. Okay, let's stay on the right, but on the inside aisle. Uh, Chip Brown, Horns, 24-7. Marcus, um, some of the guys were talking about how in that timeout after the Penn State run that you said, we need to get the ball to Dylan. Can you kind of take us through what was going on there? Um, did you tell Dylan, we got to get you the ball, how do you want it? And, you know, obviously you were right, uh, but how did that all go down? You know, Dylan was obviously playing really well throughout the whole entire night, and he was, you know, knocking down shots from everywhere and getting big, big baskets when we needed them. Uh, so I really just asked him, you know, where he wanted the ball um, on the court, which play he wanted to run to get the ball in a certain spot, and we went out there and we executed. Okay, guys, in the back, in front of the TV camera, Mike's microphone is coming your way. Yeah, back here, uh, WCPO, -T Caleb, no, WCPO TV in Cincinnati. Marcus, you guys have been tremendous in terms of turnovers this season. How much of a focus has is that for you guys, generally speaking, in practice, and how can that benefit you guys in this game specifically? Well, we like to, you know, hang our hat on our defense and, you know, causing turnovers. That's, that's definitely a huge part. It can help you offensively, help you get some easy baskets and transition. And, you know, just stopping the other team from scoring. So we definitely like to, you know, turn up the pressure on the defensive end and try and create turnovers. Uh, just try and be the most aggressive team. Other questions? Anybody on Zoom? Again, media listening on Zoom. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we will um, bring the mic. Speaking of question, guys, we'll go back to the back. On yeah. your right. Yeah, this is for any of you guys. I mean, when you look at the numbers, uh, as a team, you guys are one of the shorter teams left in the tournament, one of the shorter height-wise teams in the country. But, I mean, you make up for that athletically. How do you, though, make up for that athletically and speed-wise on the court with your guard play? You want all three to respond? Well, how about we'll go with Timmy? Um, I think it's just more of our will than anything. Um, we're all guys who could guard multiple positions, um, fairly athletic all the way around, and we got some rim protection inside as well. Um, so we're confident in that. Um, we rely on our will and our hustle and our tenacity to get the job done. Um, hard, or height has never won you a game, and um, that's not going to start now. So we're just trying to um, hustle harder than teams and play harder, and we have to hang our hat on that. Okay, here on the left inside aisle. Our right side, in other words. Um, for, uh, for Brock and Marcus, um, you're back at the T-Mobile Center where you won the Big 12 tournament. Just talk about the comfortability of being back in this building. And for, for Timmy, how excited are you to, to get on the floor after missing the, the Big 12 tournament? Let's start with Brock and then go to Marcus and then Timmy. Um, feels good to be back. You know, we we have good memories here and good energy within this gym with certain guys playing well, and just the familiarity with the area and with the gym. This is something that's going to make us more comfortable through through uh, this next game. Yeah, like Brock said, obviously, you know, we have some good memories playing in this arena, and you know, we're definitely looking to carry that you know that comfortability, that confidence over into this weekend as well. Yeah, coming off. Uh, good performance here. Um, for me personally, I'm just excited to be back on the floor and embrace the moment with my teammates. Um, we like it here in Kansas City, so we're just looking to carry that forward. Okay, far right. Marcus, uh, how much has RT said about the guy you used to coach, Sule Boom, uh, playing for Xavier now, and is he is he that much different than he was when he played for RT at UTEP? Yeah, obviously, you know, Sule, I believe it was three years, played for RT, uh, so RT knows him very well. Um, 
so yeah, just in terms of you know scouting report and things like that, he knows you know sort of his tendencies and things he likes to do. But that was also a couple of years ago, and I'm sure you know he's gotten better as a player. And obviously, he's a really good player. Um, but no different than any other game, the coaching staff just having us prepared for you know our scouting report, what we have to do, and how we have to guard. So uh, might be a, a, a few a few tidbits that most other coaches won't know here and there that definitely help us out. But um, still going to be a challenge nonetheless. Other questions? Again, on Zoom, just raise your hand. We'll bring the mic, turn it on for you. No one on Zoom. Okay. Again, on, on our right. Well, this is for all the guys. Um, how's RT been in this process, getting back up here and uh, being so close to getting to a first Final Four in 20 seasons? Timmy, why don't you start, and then we'll go down the line. Um, he's been fantastic. Um, He's kept the main goal, the main goal the whole time. Um, he's given us a great perspective and a plan to get it done. And he stayed humble along the way. Um, he knows what he's got going on. He knows what we've got going on. And we all have the same collective goal, and we're trying to get that done. Um, and he never loses focus to that. Um, he never lets him be a distraction from us or anything else. Um, it's always about team and team first. And um, he's humble, and he's hungry just like we are. And um, he, he, he doesn't feel like he's accomplished all the things he's wanted to accomplish this season. So um, we're on the same page when it comes to that. So just keep the main thing the main thing and stay humble along the way. You want Marcus? Okay. Stay on the right. You're on the aisle. Yeah, for, uh, for Timmy and Marcus, how would you describe Boom's game, what, what stands out? about him, what makes him effective? Timmy. Um, he's a great player. He can score all over the floor. Um, he's got a lot of he's got quick handle. He can go either direction. He can pull up on the break and get downhill and he likes to get teammates involved as well. So um he does he has a great all around game. Um we res- he's a player that we respect and we know it's gonna be a challenge. Um so we're just gonna try and hone in on his tendencies and uh, make it tough for him. Yeah like Timmy said he's a great player, you know a three level scorer. Um, we can also facilitate as well. Uh, yeah, just going to have to do the job on him. He has the ball in his hands, and you know he's able to make plays. So just going to have to execute scouting report. And... Okay, any other questions for the three guys? <clears throat> no? Okay, guys, we'll let you uh, leave and get ready for practice. Uh, welcome back to Kansas City. We look forward to seeing you in action tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Coach Terry will be here in just a second. Rodney Terry from the University of Texas. Coach, welcome back to Kansas City. Thank you so much. We're, we're happy to be back. Okay, opening statement for you maybe uh, about getting back to Kansas City, then we'll go to questions from the floor. Well, getting back to Kansas City wasn't easy. I mean, <laughs> we, uh, we faced a really good Colgate team uh, that put a lot of pressure on us in terms of shooting the basketball. Um, really good, well-coached Penn State team uh, as well. Um, we were here a couple of weeks ago and had a great experience in terms of uh, getting a chance to win a championship, Big 12 championship. Uh, thought our league was really, really good this year. And, you know, we had a great experience while we are here. So we're excited about being back in Kansas City. Thank you, Coach. Let's go on your extreme left. Myron Metcalf, ESPN. Uh, Rod and Eve, I've done an excellent job since taking over, now leading your team to the Sweet 16. 
Why hasn't Texas hired you as the official next head coach of the Longhorns, and what do you think it'll take to secure that role? Oh, Myron, um, I'll be honest with you. We've really just, uh, from the time that I was named acting head coach, uh, I've really just, really just poured a lot into these guys. You know, we, we have a great group of guys I've had a chance to work with every single day and uh, uh, really have tried to instill in those guys, much like how I approach life in terms of just being an everyday guy, um, you know, living where your feet are, living in the present, uh, and uh, again, controlling what you can control. Um, our administration has been great to me. Um, they've done an incredible job backing myself, our staff, and being very supportive uh, with our team. Um, you know, and really at the end of the day, we've just tried to handle what was in front of us, you know, 40 minutes by 40 minutes, you know, and uh, we're blessed enough to be here in the NCAA tournament and playing the second weekend. And uh, we've got an incredible challenge ahead with Xavier, uh, who's a well-coached team as well. And uh, we're just excited about, about where we are right now, living in the moment. Okay, on the aisle. Chip Brown with Horns 24-7. RT, can you talk about your relationship with Sule? Um, you know, getting him to UTEP. I think you spent three years with him. Um, you know, what stands out about him as a player and a person, all that stuff. Sule, boom. I just saw Sule out in the hallway. Um, boy, you talk about a great kid. One of my favorites to coach. Um, came to us from UTEP uh, after having a really successful uh, – rookie campaign as a freshman at, at San Francisco. We knew that he was coming. He was on the All-West Coast Conference rookie team. We knew he was a, a guy that was wired to score. Um, he was a guy that came in that uh, we played a lot at the two, and I made him play a little bit of point. He wasn't real happy about playing the point because he didn't get a chance to keep that ball in his hand as much as he wanted to. Uh, but just watching him grow uh, as a player uh, over the years. Uh, my last year at UTEP, he played alongside Bryson Williams, uh, Jamal Bienemy, uh Keontae Kennedy, played with some, some really good players. And uh, he was a guy that, uh, again, was all about trying to win. Sule is so ate up with winning sometimes to a fault to where he's like, just give me the ball, let me go do it. I'll, I'll show you, Coach. We'll get it done. Uh, but, but just a fierce competitor, uh, great kid, uh, love him like my own son. Uh, we'll be major competitors come Friday night, though. He wants to win, I want to win. Uh, but I but, uh, uh, can't say enough great things about him as a person and, uh, and love his mom as well. Okay, directly in front of Coach now. Coach, uh, Blair Kirkhoff with the Kansas City Star. Um, could you just list one or two of the, the biggest challenges that you face taking over at midstream? And I also wanted to ask you about the job Norm Roberts did at Kansas, who was in a similar situation. That was a great question, Blair. Um, I think the biggest thing anytime you're you're in a situation that, that I was in, I think uh one, I think you just have to be yourself. You know, I don't I don't think you, you try to be something that you're not. You can't go and you know, coach uh Chris is a great coach, Beard, but I couldn't be Beard. I'm not Beard. Beard's Beard's totally different than than, than myself. And so for myself I just had to be Rodney Terry, you know, and uh I think that boded well with our guys in terms of uh, of them really trying to buy into what we were trying to get done. We still had a whole season to play, uh, and, and everything was still in front of us. Uh, so I think that was one uh, thing that, that uh, was a challenge that uh, I'm, I'm not sure how the guys thought that that would turn out. Um, I, think, I think the other thing was uh, continuing to have great chemistry among your staff. Uh, I think our staff, had, had, you know, from the start, we were all, all committed to trying to, uh, to try to have a great season and uh, take this far, this team as far as we could take them. Um, I think also having a chance to sit down with our, our, our captains on our team, the, the, the leaders of our team, uh, and talked about what, what our new leadership style would look like, where we wanted to go, um, and, and really trying to uh, continue to, to, to build on what we were already trying to do early in the season. Um, I think Norm, again, I know Norm a long time as well, long time assistant. Um, you know, I, I think, again, you have to be ready, prepared for the opportunity, too. Norm's been a head coach, uh, so he knows what, uh, what, what, what that entails in terms of, of leading a program. I thought he did a, a very admirable job uh, down the stretch uh, in leading KU. You know, you, you have a Hall of Fame coach that you're working with and Coach Self that we have the utmost respect for, and hopefully, hopefully he's doing well as well. Send prayers to him and, uh, and his family. 
Uh, but but you had a quality guy in Norm Roberts who's been a part of the program and has been very instrumental in the, in the success of that program at a very high level. Uh, he's also, I'm sure, had a voice as well. Um, I had a voice. Uh, I was already coaching. It wasn't like you were just all of a sudden sprung in front of the team. I was already coaching the team uh, just on the defensive side of the ball and in front of those guys. I'm sure Norm, likewise, was in front of those guys. And uh, when you're able to do that, it makes a, a smoother transition in terms of the guys understanding uh, your style and, uh, and and also being held accountable. But I thought Norm did a great job, you know, and uh, it probably wasn't an easy situation for him as well uh, because because you're never expecting what happened to, to Coach Self to happen during the season at the most pivotal time of the season as well. But I thought he did a great job. Coach is right. Hey, RT, Cedric Golden, Austin, American Statesman. Um, in 2008, you guys made it to the Elite Eight, and uh, this – Teams trying to get there as well, and uh, the alumni from uh, the guys from that team have been really active in reaching out to you and supporting. What does that mean to you as a guy who recruited a lot of those guys, AJ Abrams, DJ Augustine, Connor Ashley, those guys? What does that mean to you all these years later? Well, I always tell guys when you, you know when you sign up to uh, to be a part of uh, a part of your program, they're part of your family for life. You know, and I think that's just, uh, again, just a reflection of your lifelong relationships that you have with your players. You don't just coach guys for four years and, and you're still not a part of their of their lives. You're going to be at their weddings. You're going to call them and talk to them when they have their first kids. And uh, uh, I think I've always tried to do a great job of staying in my, my former players' lives and, uh, um, you know, still being a part of what they're doing and uh, and investing in those guys as, as true an extension of, extension of my family. As well, so I think that just kind of speaks volumes to to that those relationships. Extreme right by the column. Rodney Adam Winkler with ABC 13 out of Houston. Uh, this journey of yours started in Angleton. Uh, I wonder what maybe some of the values you you gathered, the lessons you taught at your alma mater too, uh, that you uh, that you got, took from Angleton. I also wonder if maybe you're hearing from a few more people now that you're leading the Texas Longhorns to the Sweet 16. Yeah, for people that don't know Adam. Um, Angleton, Texas, a little small town right outside, 22 miles south of Houston, uh, outside of the uh, outside of the big city, right? Uh, but but no, I uh, man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Growing up in a small town, everybody knows everybody. Uh, you play every sport, you know. And uh, uh, I had some great coaches and great guys that that uh, instilled in me uh, discipline, you know, respect for how hard you have to work. Um, I had a football coach named Coach Kettler. He played for Bear Bryant and uh, played for the Junction Boys. And, uh, boy, you know, we didn't get very many water breaks. You know, he had that tower like Bear Bryant would have as well in football. Uh, but he always came in every day. And uh, he always said, hey, man, it's a great day to be alive, man. And uh, we looked at Coach Keller like he was half crazy, you know. He got us out of here in this 100-degree weather, and we're doing two a days. But, uh, but anyway, you know, it just instilled a lot of toughness in you. I had a great high school basketball coach in Coach Reynolds. Uh, was a really good player at TCU, and uh, at, at, uh, played at a very good level. And uh, again, my upbringing there, well, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I I got the best of, of really a lot of great worlds, and you know, played a lot of baseball too. You know, when you grow up, you play every sport. You know, and uh, uh, just had a great, great uh, place to grow up and a great time uh, to grow up in that in that area. So, um, am I am I hearing from a lot of those classmates and people back that way? A hundred percent. You know, a lot of Longhorn fans back that way in Brazoria County. Okay, extreme left. Uh, Coach Terry, hey, uh, I wanted to ask you about Christian Bishop and the value of having an experienced guy, fifth-year guy like that, who's willing to take a role on a team and, and do his part. CB, boy, I tell you what, he uh, he's a guy that we know day in and day out, whether it be in practice and games, he's going to bring energy. Uh, he's going to bring some physicality. And uh, – He's gonna make some things happen out on the court, you know. Uh, he's uh, he had some he's had some really good games for us where he's come in and, and made, made incredible impacts on both ends of the floor. Uh, he's been a team guy, you know. Uh, started a lot of games for us last year. Coming off the bench this year, hasn't complained one time. Just been all about winning. Uh, was super excited last night to be back in his hometown, you know. Kansas City coach, we're back, you know, and. Uh, 
you know, he's talking about the hotel where he had his prom and all that good stuff. So, you know, he's excited about being back here. He'll have a lot of family here and a lot of people rooting for him here. But uh, he's, been, he's been great uh, to work with the last two years. Love, CB. Okay, now on the aisle here on the right. Um, RT, Chip Brown, Horns 24-7. What, two questions, what have you learned in this process? What have you experienced that's made you a better head coach? Um, and secondly, did you finally demand Dylan DeZoo start taking shots? Because you've been telling him to shoot it all year, but, but then it finally happened. Well, again, I, I looked at, you know, I'd kind of stretch my head back a little bit too and look at turning points. Uh, what's, what's made me a better coach? I think what made me a better coach, uh, you know, I was, had a chance to be blessed to coach 10 years as a head coach and trying to build programs at Fresno State and trying to build a program at, at UTEP. Um, you know, you learn, you know, how to, to, to for your, your roster management this day and time, especially with the portal, uh, retention with guys, you know, how, how, to, how to put together a roster and try to put yourself in the best position to be successful uh, in year one and year two. But uh, I think having had a chance to be an assistant as associate head coach a year ago, step back a little bit, take a deep breath, and uh, kind of give a, get a different perspective on things. Uh, you know, when you're a head coach and you're just going, 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 I think you take a lot of things for granted in terms of just really enjoying the process. A lot of people will tell you, man, just enjoy it, soak it up, you know, and uh, I thought having had a chance to be one year removed, I've really done that this year. I've really tried to just soak it in, enjoy the process, enjoy working with my guys every day, smile a little bit, don't always have a growl all the time and think you have to be, you know, coach your team hard and coach upset. You don't have to really do that. Enjoy this process, man. You get a chance to do it, you know, maybe one time in your life uh, and everything. So just uh, just make the most of it. I think that's one thing I've really uh, uh, taken away the most. And, uh, and, and really, you know, I think my demeanor has been a whole lot different. I've been a lot more poised and calm in, a, in, a, in situations probably in the past. I probably wouldn't have been as much, as much uh, in, in that regards. But, uh, man, it's been, a, it's been an incredible journey. Yeah, absolutely. Dylan. 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 I left that part out about Dylan. We're playing at TCU. We're playing. We were in the last week of the season, and uh, we're trying to win the regular season Big 12 race, and uh, we're having a tough go first half over at TCU. They're kind of taking it to us a little bit. And uh, my guys were ready to play, though. They knew what they were playing for. They knew they were playing for a conference championship. And, uh, boy, we just couldn't get it going that day. And I came in at halftime, and I was – I knew we were ready to play, but I thought we were a little too amped up to play, you know. And uh, and they were having their way with us. And I kind of challenged some guys in the in, in the uh, in the halftime halftime speech there a little bit in terms of guys need to step up, you know, and, and need to play at a whole different level. You're playing, you know, not to a point to where you're playing scared, but you're not playing, you know, as confident as you need to play in so many words, and uh, he was one of those guys that was challenged at a very high level. He had a lot of chippies early in the game that he could have converted for us that would have changed the the, uh, the early part of that ball game, and uh, I think from that point on, it's been over. He's like, Coach, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do my part with it, and uh, and he's done that. He's really responded. He responded in that game at an incredible level. We had a great second half, and uh, really the rest has been history in terms of uh, I think where he's gone in postseason play. Okay, only a few more minutes to go in this segment here on the left now. Yeah, uh, ESPN, uh, he only played for one year at the school, but Kevin Durant uh, has been important to this program. What has he meant uh, to you all, and, and has he reached out you know, during this run? Yeah, no, Myron, um, KD, I got a chance to coach KD the one year he was in college at Texas, and uh, – you talk about a fun, fun bunch to work with right there. Now we had set those in the days you, you lose the entire team. I think we were coming off an elite eight team, uh, and Lamarcus Aldridge and PJ Tucker and uh, Daniel Gibson, all those guys going out the door. We bring in seven freshmen, and uh, KD's you know probably the centerpiece of that group. But we had a, gr a good group of seven guys that came in, and they were fun to coach and fun to work with. We were a high scoring team, a young team. I think we started four freshmen and one sophomore, AJ Abrams. I think second all-time leading scorer at the school. Uh, but, um, man, he had an incredible run. We had an incredible run. We had a chance to win both the, the regular season and 
um, Big 12 tournament. We lost to Kansas, both of those. Um, that, that year we finished second in the regular season and we lost a, a Big 12 conference tournament championship game that we feel like we should have won. Uh, so we, we, we didn't win the championship that year. Uh, but then we go into the NCAA tournament. He plays well in the tournament. But I say all those things because he had an incredible experience at Texas in the one year. And if you didn't know he, if you didn't know he was leaving, you, you would have known he was leaving. I mean, up until the time he got up and did his press conference and say, "Hey, I've got to put my name in the draft," you would have thought he still was going to be with us. But uh, uh, I know he's very fond of Texas. Uh, his experience that he had, he came back this summer, and uh, he hadn't been back on campus in a long time, and uh, got a chance to. To work out with our guys, just jump right in and whatever you guys coach, you know, whatever you guys are doing, I'm doing, you know. And uh, I think our guys are looking around like, wow, okay, Kevin's jumping in all the stuff we're doing. And uh, um, and he just spent some time. He he really spent time with the with the players that we have currently on our team. Uh, worked out with those guys, and uh, he's one of those guys that's vested in our program. He wants nothing but the best for for Texas and uh, having having a, a personal relationship with him. Um, I think it means a lot to him and what we're doing and, and how we're doing it right now. Okay, I have time for one last question. We'll hear go on the aisle. Here uh, Nick Moll with the San Antonio Express News. Yeah, Rodney, you know, you've been to Sweet 16s before. You, you've been to the Final Four. You've also, you know, you had a team with KD that flamed out in the second round. Do you understand what it takes to, to kind of get to this, this level? I mean, how have those past experiences sort of helped you this week? Yeah, I don't know if we flamed out, Nick, but I'm <laughs> That was a pretty good team. <laughs> we actually just ended up having to play the hottest team. We played we played uh, USC. They were they were the hottest team in the tournament, and they had pros too. They were they were pretty good too. Josh Gibson and those guys. But no, um, you know I don't know. Uh, we 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 uh, we experienced a high level of success when I was here before, and you know we expected to be uh, in the second weekend every year. You know when we when we when we weren't in the, the second weekend. Um, then we were disappointed in our season. That, those, that was the standard, and those were the expectations. And when I came back here and joined Chris on the staff here, you know, those were the same type of expectations that we had. We, we want to be a Monday night program. We want to try to get to, get to that last night and uh, uh, get to that third weekend to where you're playing and, uh, and, and trying to, you know, play for the whole thing. Uh, I think over the course of that time, you know, I think you're always trying to, trying to figure out how you want to manage the week, you know, and, you know, I spoke to Rick a couple of days ago and just talking about, you, you know, we have the Friday game, they have the Thursday game. You know, you have to really manage, you know, your workload that week and you want your guys to be fresh and you want them peaking and playing at the right time uh, come Friday night. Uh, so just, you know, just talking with him a little bit about that process and talking about some things that, that uh, we did during those stretches as well. I think you always lean on other people a lot of times too that, that have also been there, but uh um, our strength coach, John Riley, has done a great job with our guys physically this year, and we feel like we're in a good place from, from a physical standpoint. Uh, but, but drawing on the experiences, the thing that I've tried to echo to our guys, we're guaranteed 40 minutes. You know, you can't waste 20 minutes this time of year. You've got to play as hard as you can play, you know, um, from start to finish. And we have an incredible challenge with a really, really good Xavier team um, that uh, – that's well coached, and uh, we have a lot of respect for it. So, you know, that's been our focus, and uh, we've had we've had a really good prep week for for a really good opponent. Okay, coach, thank you. We'll let you run off to practice and get ready for tomorrow's game. Thank, thank you. you for being here. <clears throat> thank you, coach. Oh, thank you. See you, see you tomorrow. Right. Charlie, thank you.